Okay, thank you, Julian, and uh, thank you, Celine, for uh, having me. Um, this, um, I've been uh, trying to write a book about uh, worker cooperatives, and so what I'll try to do today is to give you a flavor of, uh, of, of what, I'm, what I'm trying to achieve with this book and uh, uh, how I'm trying to, um, to do it, what motivated me, and what are the main, some of the main ideas in the book. Um, don't get too scared or too turned off by this uh, uh, title. This is just a, a mnemonic for uh, something that will come up later and I will explain later. But just to uh, give a preview, IC Coop is, uh, is kind of the uh, acronym for a proposal that I'm trying to develop in this book. Uh, so um, I think uh, we are aware, uh, because everybody is aware, or the fact that um, the, in the arrangement under which the economy of the UK and many, many other countries have been operating over the last several decades have now led to a situation where there is an enormous amount of inequality of income and of wealth, that this inequality is growing and that uh, the inequality has reached uh, levels such that um, society has become polarized and, um, and partitioned uh, into, into groups, some, some groups of rich, uh, well-off, who are very rarely in contact with people who are middle class or, uh, or less than middle class, and a vast number of people who uh, are also completely separated from the people at the, at the top of the income distribution. So inequality, growing inequality, and polarization. And uh, it's not only that the gaps between rich and poor are becoming larger and larger, and they have become very, very large. Um, it's also that the, for very large portions of the populations, um, in fact, uh, even the absolute level of living standards uh, has stagnated completely. Uh, the most extreme case of this is the US, where pretty much everybody below the median income, that is 50% of the population, uh, has had no increase in living standards for about 30, perhaps 40 years. And groups within this group actually have declining in living standards. There are <coughs> extreme cases in which people uh, are actually experiencing declining life expectancy. Now that um, this, uh, this this overall picture of increasing inequality, stagnating living standards, exclusion of large groups of population from the benefits of growth, what I call exclusive growth, of course, is very unappealing in itself. It's telling us that the arrangements under which we operate are failing to satisfy the aspirations of perhaps the majority of the population. They're also very corrosive. Can I ask? Uh, yeah, please come in. Hello? So that might have been a mistake. Please stay muted, that would be perfect. No, 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 actually, like, like, let me just say, I, 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 I was happy, I was encouraged by that because I, I, I will totally welcome people unmuting themselves and jumping in with questions or comments. That's totally fine. So uh, if, if that was an aborted question, please try again. Uh, do, do, do jump in, do stop me. Uh, it's much more fun if you do that way, okay? So I really mean it. No problem. No problem if you want to jump in and stop. Um, what I was saying is that uh, it's obviously an indication of a failure of uh, satisfying the aspiration of large uh, uh, portions of the population, it also has very corrosive consequences for uh, many areas of public and private life. Um, and I think... Uh, right. Yes. Okay. Questions, yes. Random interruptions, no. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so I was, I was going to talk about the political consequences. Um, and uh, I mean, this is not a completely uh, established uh, proposition, but I think a lot of uh, 
commentators and observers have pointed out that some of the more appeal, some of the, the less appealing, the more unsavory development in politics in many countries uh, are uh, in part in part associated with the frustrations of those who feel left behind by the model of growth we are having unable to access and participate in the benefits of growth and have developed a sense of uh, grievance and um, anger in some cases towards the elite, towards those who are experienced as benefiting from, from this growth. And so a lot of negative uh, political consequences are potentially also uh, negative repercussions on some weaker groups that become the targets of, uh, of these uh, grievances like immigrants, like minorities, uh, and so on. So broadly speaking, not a good picture, not a good performance, and more particularly, uh, I would say a failure to do what we want the economic system to do, which is to uh, satisfy the aspirations of all, or at least of most. Now, many people who uh, have uh, make these observations about inequality and its um, very undesirable consequences um, have argued that the solution to that, that the, the, the plausible response to that that we need is to uh, enhance the redistributive role of the state. Mm -hmm. So more progressive taxation, uh, maybe wealth taxes has been a, a highly discussed uh, discussion uh, with attendant um, then uh, increase the support for the poor, uh, maybe more investment in education, um, more, uh, more subsidies for the unemployed, uh, more, uh, um, more training, uh, rebalancing things through uh, taxes and subsidies. Uh, broadly speaking, okay, so redistribution is very much on the political agenda as a way to try to address this uh, increasing inequality. Uh, Francesco, a few yes. things. I think we have two questions. Okay. Some people have their hands up. Okay, yeah, come in. Uh, I cannot see you guys. Uh, so that, thank you, Celine, for that. And no whoever worries. has the hand up, unmute yourself and ask the question. So Momina, do you want to maybe ask first? Mm. Either Momina or Abdullah, if any of you have questions. Hmm. All right, sorry about that. I think we should maybe continue. That's all right. It's all right. Um, now, it, it, this, um, I, I was saying that uh, redistribution is often uh, touted as um, the uh, way to address this um, uh, very unsatisfactory situation of profound inequality. And in, in my book, the first chapter is, uh, uh, I, I, I want, I tackle this, uh, uh, idea because I think it's very important to understand that um, it's actually a pipe dream. It's not going to be the solution. And to understand why, all we need to do is to ask ourselves why there is so little distribution being made today and also why precisely over the decades in which inequality was becoming larger and larger, Redistribution was actually reduced. Uh, you know, taxes on the rich uh, declined, uh, transfers to the poor declined, uh, the tax system was made less progressive, uh, and all sorts, and in fact, uh, in many other ways, it was made arguably uh, regressive, particularly in terms of all sorts of loopholes, tax loopholes accessible to the rich. Uh, and all sorts of subsidies that the government are been paying to the corp to corporations. Um, and the answer is very simple. The answer is that in politics, much more than we used to think, uh, money is incredibly important and trumps numbers. 
Uh, and so we may very well have a larger number of people who would benefit from redistribution. The fact of the matter is that the money is with those who uh, lose from redistribution, is in the hands of the rich, is in the, in the hands of the uh, large corporations. And in the political systems as we have them now, not idealized ones, but the, the, the real uh, political system, we have them, uh, people with money can exercise an absolutely disproportionate influence on the political process. And in the book, I, I, I go at length into the history of not only fiscal policy, the so tax and subsidies, but also competition policy, um, uh, policies towards labor market and unions in particular, minimum wages, uh, and so on. And I show, I, 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 I rely on a vast empirical literature by political scientists and economists. I show how systematically um, everywhere, every time the political process was biased towards the interests of the rich. And how do they do it? They do it through political donations. So they give money to politicians to vote a certain way. They do it by uh, influencing um, uh, the media and uh, setting up uh, TV, TV channels or, uh, or internet channels that uh, advance the arguments anti-redistribution, pro-rich, um, and they do so by um, fi financing campaigns, by, by using uh, uh, money to uh, affect campaigns by running ads, for example, in support of those politicians who will then um, pursue the policies that uh, are in the interest of the rich. And the, 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 the fundamental problem of distribution is one, is a, is a logical one. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a theoretical argument that I make, which is in a system that creates simultaneously with the process of wealth creation, it creates some rich people and some poor people. It also in doing so, it creates the powerful constituency, which is against the distribution. Okay, so if we produce, if we make our pie in such a way that out of the oven you get a big pie and a small pie coming out of the oven, the person with the big pie will um, resist the distribution and will have the power through money, through political influence, to prevent and stop and reverse the distribution. So the distribution doesn't happen, and if it happens, it doesn't stick because soon enough, the power of money speaks louder than votes, than, 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 than the numbers, and it leads to its undoing. And, and that's the story of the last 40 years, 40, 50 years. From the 60s, you have had a systematic demolish, demolition of the welfare system, of the progressive tax system, of the unions, with the minimum wage, all, uh, and, and you can trace that very clearly to political donations, by uh, elite donors, you can trace it to in social media influence, media influence, and you uh, trace it to uh, advertise, political advertising by the rich. So what's th that also tells us what would work, okay? What would work is something that creates wealth simultaneously with its equal distribution. Okay, the problem with distribution is that distribution is a second stage thing. Redistribution works like this. You first create wealth and then you redistribute it. It doesn't work because when you create unequal wealth, then the rich will oppose redistribution. So what you need is a system that creates wealth and at the same time distributes this wealth equally in one go. This is what I call here, the last bullet point, inbuilt inclusion. So growth cannot be made inclusive if it is not inclusive from the start. The inclusion must be built in in the same process, in the same moment in which the wealth is created. Creation of wealth and this equal division must come simultaneously. If you rely on a two-stage thing, first create the wealth, then the distributed is not gonna work. The rich will stop it, okay? So that's where 
my IC corps come. Okay, that's going to be my inclusive growth engine. That's why I think you need um, something other than uh, redistribution. Okay, so what are IC corps? Well, first let's do the co-op part. Okay, these are worker cooperatives. Okay, now I don't know you guys what do you know about worker cooperatives? So let me just give you very briefly what, you what they are, and then I'll, I'll tell you more about it later, but just to give you a, a very first pass flavor. They are um, firms which are managed and owned by the workers. So there is no external owner. There are no shareholders. There are no uh, private individuals who have ownership of the firm. The firm is an object, a concern, an activity, which is managed directly by the workers without an outside claim by an owner, by a shareholders on any kind of share in the income coming from it. So there is no outside owners, it's managed by the workers. Okay, I'll be more precise in a minute. Um, and why do I think it's natural to look at this uh, type of uh, institution? Well, the first thing to say is that it's natural to think that once you have a firm that is managed by the workers themselves, it will lead to a much more equalitarian pay among the workers. Not necessarily equal pay, uh, but much less unequal. You are familiar, I'm, I hope, with the fact that in some of the largest corporations, and sometimes even middle-sized corporations, the ratio of the pay of the very top managers to the average worker in the firm can be in the order of 100, sometimes 500, okay, where the CEO literally take some millions and millions and millions and millions a year. And whereas you know, the average worker will take home 25,000, 30,000, okay? Um, that's very unlikely to happen in a labor managed firm where it's the workers who appoint the managers and where the manager pay has to be approved by the other workers as well. So there is a natural sense in which um, co-ops will have much flatter pay gradients than uh, corporations. And by the way, in my chapter one, I also talk a lot about how is it possible uh, and how it can be justified that pay in uh, the largest corporations can be so incredibly uh, unequal and the conclusion is obviously it can't be. I mean, there is no economic rationalization that will allow you to say that that makes any sense. Um, and it boils down to bargaining power, it boils down to CEOs having disproportionately information uh, over shareholders, and basically um, CEOs exploiting both the workers and the shareholders to carve out a totally disproportionate share of income for themselves. Again, I don't have time to go into it here, but uh, in, in, you know, when my book comes out, send me an email, I send you a, a copy and you can see it there. Um, the other thing that obviously a cooperative does is it eliminates capital income. Okay, so part of the inequality in our society comes from the fact that capital, is those who own shares in corporations or are private owners of corporations have been able over the last few decades to capture a larger and larger share of the income produced by the corporation. Again, we can talk about why that is. I think a big chunk of it comes from the fact that corporations have come gradually to exercise more and more market power thanks to um, what uh, is called the um, uh, deregulation, which has basically meant uh, allowing corporations to uh, establish uh, more and more monopolistic uh, rents in product market, and also thanks to increasingly monopsonistic labor market, 
which is when corporations are uh, have the market power over workers. And so that has allowed corporations to squeeze pay uh, more and more over the last decades. And it has resulted in um, capital income uh, grabbing a larger and larger share of income. So, that, so now if you then move to a co-op based model, uh, you don't have capital income anymore. Uh, because all of the income of the corporation goes to the workers. So you, in one, just in one step, you have eliminated this important source of inequality. Um, finally, uh, as I will uh, show uh, uh, in a minute, um, the uh, cooperative economy is one where, the, by, by definition, there is no... Um, there is no way for, um, for, for, for people to accumulate large fortunes in terms of shares in corporations. And again, dynastic wealth accumulation, whereby the children of the rich inherit large portfolios of shares, and that allows them to start already much richer, uh, that's also eliminated. In a so I think it's easy to see why cooperatives are, have the potential to generate a much more uh, equal and inclusive society. Okay, that's the easy part. Now, the problem, uh, however, that we need to confront is to say, well, it's all good and well to have more inclusion, but we still want growth. Okay, we don't want to uh, have a system where we, um, uh, growth that, that we have that is inclusive, but we lose the growth. Uh, and so it's very important that we make sure that our cooperative based system is one that is relatively efficient and still uh, generates, uh, that generates growth for, for society. And this is where the IC part of my IC co-ops com concept comes from. Now IC stands for incentive compatible. Now, if we were there in person, I would ask you if you remember what that means from micro. Uh, but uh, since I cannot ask you that question, uh, uh, let me just remind you, incentive compatible just means that, essentially, it means smartly designed. Design thinking about what are the incentives of the people who, in this case, operate in this cooperative. We want to make sure that the people who run these cooperatives and work in these cooperatives have the right incentives to uh, operate these cooperatives efficiently. Because we don't want to give up on the growth, or at least not all of it. We still want to have a system that, that, uh, that has a good growth performance. And it's important to say this because it is very important to be upfront about this. Cooperatives as we know them, and by the way, I hope, it's, I hope you guys know, but if, if not, take my word for it. There are a lot of cooperatives out there, a lot, okay? So the work of cooperatives is not some crazy dream uh, that exists only in a parallel universe. Um, worker cooperatives exist in every country. In the UK, there are lots of worker cooperatives that do exactly what I said before, equalitarian pay, worker management, um, no shareholders, no owners. Even in the US, there are worker cooperatives. In Italy, in Spain, in France, in India, in Nigeria, there are every country you'll find. Not, that, not an enormous amount, not a huge amount, certainly a small share of, of the economy is worker cooperatives, but there are worker cooperatives in pretty much every country in the world, and they're operating, and some of them are quite successful. But not all of them are successful. It's fair to say that the median cooperatives is mm, not that successful. No, it doesn't operate that efficiently. Okay, they're okay, um, but you get the impression that they could do much better. And so that's where, kind of, in some sense, the book comes in, which says, okay, let's use the tools of economics to design smart cooperatives, to design cooperatives that will do better than the standard cooperatives that you run into in the UK economy, for example. Uh, so there are two aspects of this, and I'll, I'll try to say something about both in the time I've left. 
Um, Celine, when do we, when should I stop for the Q and A? Seven fifteen, something like that. Around seven fifteen would be great. Yeah. That being said, okay. we do have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we have a question from Erwin who asks, "How do you relate to historical examples of cooperatives such as Mondragon and industry in Emilia Romagna?" Yeah, we yeah, have exactly. I mean, that's uh, it's very linked to what um, I was just saying a minute ago. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So Mondragon for me is an example of that very comes very close to the IC co -op. Okay, so that's an exceptionally successful um, co-op experience in the, in the Basque country in, in Spain, but of course now it's uh, almost a nationwide institu institution. It, it adheres pretty, um, pretty well to the basic uh, uh, guidelines of what makes a co-op. It's definitely worker managed, it's definitely quite egalitarian, uh, it definitely doesn't allow for um, uh, trading of shares. So in that sense, it's a co-op, uh, no question about it. Okay, I fixed the boxes, but on top of that, and that's very important, it's almost like the poster boy for the IC uh, co-op, okay? So if all co-ops were like Mondra Mondragon, I wouldn't have to write my book um, because, you know, they would have already, you know, it would mean that they, they've all figured it out already. Unfortunately, the problem is that Mondragon is more um, uh, uh, an exception than the rule in the universe, cooperative universe. And the vast majority, I would say, are much less, uh, you know, are, are much less smart than, than Mondragon. And so in some sense, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, come up with what makes, you know, to, to, to uh, distill what makes a, a, a cop, a Mondragon versus another cop that kind of more or less survives with 10 employees for 20 years without ever growing, okay? So I hope that uh, I answered that question. If I didn't, come back to me, okay? So there are two parts of thinking about an, a, a smart, um, inclusive growth economy based on co-ops. One is micro and one is macro. So micro is what we were just saying. How do you, def how, how do you design Mondragon? What are the things you need to, uh, to think about um, at the micro level? But in the book, perhaps because I'm a, I'm a macro guy at heart, I also go a little bit beyond that and say, um, suppose you, got the chance to design not only the individual co-ops, but you also get the chance to um, design the, um, the whole environment, uh, the whole ecosystem in which these co-ops will operate. Uh, how would that look like? You know, how would you design labor markets, product markets, financial markets to, to make the most out of the inclusive growth potential of co-ops. So I'll, I, I, that's also a big part of, of the book. Uh, okay, I think we already said this by now, you know, what's a co-op? It's, it's, um, it's, it's a firm where assets are non-tradable, so I cannot sell shares. Even if I'm a worker in a co-op, I cannot tell Celine, yeah, Celine, look, you, you can take my share, you can buy my share of the co-op. I cannot do that. If I, if I want to leave the cop, I, I, you know, that's, I, I can do it, but I don't, I don't take away anything with me. With an exception I'll talk about in a minute. And then workers are residual claimants, okay? Every, every, every cash flow that the cooperatives does that is left after paying for inputs or other stuff goes to the uh, workers and very importantly, it's democratically managed by the workers, okay? So the workers, you know, they elect the CEO, they elect the council, they approve the most important strategic decisions, you know, should we open a plant in China? Well, let's vote on it. Okay, so let me just give you now some very quick, um, very quick uh, pointers to uh, things that uh, are important. Some of them are pretty trivial, uh, you know, they're gonna sound extremely prosaic, but, uh, Nonetheless, uh, I think a lot of the um, co-ops uh, 
um, kind of fal falter on this pretty trivial and prosaic point. So the most, the most prosaic one is the form of democracy that uh, Coop knew. So here is, um, so the distinction here is, is, is an important one, which is representative versus direct democracy. Uh, so the red democracy is basically say each and every decision must be taken uh, uh, by the assembly of all the workers. And representative democracy means uh, no, the workers are going to elect a CEO uh, or maybe a, a board, uh, depending on the size of the call. And these people who are elected, they actually have a lot of power to make decisions. Now. The experience of the of cops is that the red democracy doesn't work, but uh, a lot of cops insist on the red democracy, and that uh, has a little bit to do with the fact that a lot of the uh, of cops uh, are born of a very idealistic, very leftist movements uh, and uh, inst with very leftist instincts, and so everything has to be discussed, everything has to be go to the assembly and basically you, you know you end up with uh, with cops that spend you know four days a week in permanent permanent assembly and that cannot work that's that's a catastrophic uh way of doing that so it's as i say it's, it's a very sim simple very prosaic but it's incredibly important um uh and then you know there are similar things that you can say about for example effort um there are many co-ops that are born of a socialist tradition. Uh, in that socialist tradition, Marx's analysis is very important. And Marx said that workers shirk because the capitalist appropriates the surplus value of labor. Once you remove the capitalist, the workers automatically stop shirking. And that's just not true. Uh, you know, you need some kind of, you need a, some kind of um, agreed discipline, discipline uh, mechanism. So, you know, there are cooperatives that tolerate uh, shirking, many, many cooperatives tolerate, tolerate shirking by other workers. You cannot have it that way. You need, you need to have hard nosed, hard nosed rules where workers are, uh, are made to actually leave the co-op if they, insist on sharing, for example, okay? So may, there are many of these kind of very down to earth, very practical uh, features that you need to have. Um, but it's important, you know, they kind of sound obvious, but it's important to stress them because many cops fall, falter on those very things. Now, the, the one, the most interesting um, and, and most novel point that I make instead uh, is about investment. And this is actually something that I, I want to explain uh, in a minute. So in, um, in a capitalist firm, uh, the secret of success of capitalism is the following. Um, the person who owns the capital the person who decides to invest in capital, say a firm owner, they decide to expand the plant or to build a new plant or to buy some new machinery. Why do they do that? Well, they do that because they know that one way or the other, they will benefit in the future from the benefits of that investment. Okay, why? Well, if I continue to be the owner of the plant tomorrow, I will get the profits. But if I decide to sell the plant, that value of my investment will be embodied in the price that I can sell the plant for. So the great success of capitalism is that it gives the capitalists an incentive to invest. Okay, they can be they can, uh, they can realize the benefits from their investment through their ownership of the capital. And that poses the biggest conceptual challenge for cooperatives. Because remember, if I'm a worker today in a cooperative, 
and the CEO comes to me and says, we want to spend money on a new factory floor. And I am 55, which is about what I am. I'm gonna say, well, wait a minute. In five years, six years, I'm retired. Why should I support taking money out of my pockets? Okay, because that money, if it wasn't invested, would come to me as a distribution of the cash flow. Why should I support this investment if I might not be there when this investment actually starts paying off? Or I might say, wait a minute, I'm not sure I'm going to be still working for this cooperative. Maybe I'm going to have a change in five years. Even if I'm a young worker, I would say, well, maybe I'm working for another cooperative in five years when the plant is ready to produce. So why should I support investment in this plant today when um, there is a possibility, maybe a high chance, that I won't be there when the plant, when this investment pays off? I would rather, I say, I vote against, and they say, no, 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 distribute the money today to the workers today. Okay, I want to pocket it now. That's what I call the present bias of cooperative workers. They are biased toward the present. They don't care that much about the future. And that's very different from, from capitalism because the capitalism has other ways of recouping the investment. So that's a challenge. And I think that's um, the fundamentally, the, 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 my sense uh, is that this is the basic reason why you see that most co-ops don't grow. You know, they don't necessarily exit the market. They last, you know, they, they stay there with 10, 15 workers, year in, year out. But you see many, many co-ops, the majority of co-ops don't grow. Whereas capitalist firms, they grow. But of course, you want firms to grow, to have a growing economy. And so that's a big challenge. So what's my solution? My solution is, and this is something that is virtually never done in real world corps. So this is, you know, there is one change that I hope the book will help do is, is this one, in the way corps are designed. The solution is, is the direct, comes directly from the reasoning I gave you, which is let's give former workers rights to participate in the distribution of cash flow okay every year when the cop decides to distribute money to its workers it's not only the current workers of the cop who get to participate in it but also former workers workers who are no longer with the cop whether they went to another cop or whether they retired um, they still get to participate and now my incentives as a worker in a co-op are very different because when the CEO comes to the assembly and says, let's build a new plant, I said, why not? I, I will be participate in, in the distribution of cash flow when that plant starts producing. So if that's a, a, an investment that makes sense for the co-op, I, I can support it because I, I won't lose the, you know, yes, I get less money in my pocket today, but it's for the benefit of more money in my pocket tomorrow when the investment is back. So that's my solution. And there are technical details, lots of technical details to be ironed out. And I do that in the book. Uh, I can't, these are the last, the last two bullet, bullet points are about these technical details. We can talk about it in the Q&A if you want, but let me not talk about it now because I'm running out of time. I have three minutes left. So, um, so macro features, okay, this is uh, in, in, in two minutes, uh, let me give you a, a, the gist of it. So the first thing I want to say, which is very, very important, is that this can work with completely free product markets and labor markets, okay? So this is not some kind of Stalinist uh, central planning, uh, you know, uh, pipe dream or pipe nightmare. Uh, it's, um, this is all about, say, having this co-op competing, competing on free 
powder markets. In fact, what I, I, I definitely want an antitrust agency in this product market to make sure that uh, competition is preserved. But I want these scopes to compete. I want these scopes to be able to uh, find the market price that equilibrate demand and supply. I want all the good things that you've learned from micro that uh, free product markets do. I want that, okay? So there is no central planner here. There is no, uh, uh. similarly, I want, uh, free labor markets in the sense that I want cops to be absolutely free to fire workers if they find that they need to shrink for efficiency reasons or because these workers are underperforming. And I want, of course, these cops to be able to invite new members to join them if they want to expand. And similarly, I want workers to be completely free to say, you know what, I'm, I'm not doing as well as I could in this cop. I want to move to another cop. I want these workers to be able to search for the cop they want to work for. Okay, so free product market through labor market. Now, I am a little bit less liberal with financial markets. And the reason for that, of course, is kind of um, part of the nature of the beast, because I told you that co-ops are by intrinsically uh, have to come with non-tradability of shares. Once you make trade shares tradable, you have all a distinction between owners and workers. And so it, that's no longer a call. So it's, it's, um, it's uh, part of the nature of a co-based economy that there is no stock market. There is no trade, there are no shares. But also I go beyond that and I also want to limit Debt, and I want to limit debt precisely because the accumulation of credit positions by individuals vis-a-vis -vis other individuals creates a lot of inequality that we are seeing in our society. And so I want to limit debt. I still want a way for co-ops to be able to borrow money to finance some of their investment if they want to, or to uh, for workers to finance their retirement and so what I propose is that there are pension funds okay so there is a, a financial market where pension funds operate these pension funds are just cooperatives are all other firms in the economy so they, they have the same principles of co-ops but their business is to uh, collect savings from workers and lend to co-ops that want to finance their investments and then when these co-ops um, pay back interest, then these pension funds turn around and they pay pensions to the, to the workers who have invested in them. Okay, so I can talk more about, you know, if that's interesting you, um, I, I'm very happy to talk more about that. That was very short, but that's, um, that's in, you know, in the book I talk also about housing market taxation, human capital accumulation, okay? Anyway, the bottom line is uh, I have this proposal to have smart co-ops, IC co-ops, um, deliver um, growth because I think they, they can be made to be efficient, they can be made to be dynamic, they, made, they can be made to be, to be innovative uh, if they are smartly designed and they are embedded in a supportive environment around them. So they can deliver growth, but crucially this growth is by construction, because of the very nature of the process that creates this growth, is inclusive, is equalitarian. 